thank you so much for being here for Rome Theater's stage production of uh, Population 45 by Michael Perry. We are very excited to bring this to you as part of the Door County Reads. So, um, if you are joining us on live online, please um, say hi or where you're from or where you're watching from. We would love to know that as well because we do have a nice audience here, but I'd like to know who's joining us live. So, please um, say hi. Well, joining us though today, we have Beth Lockett from the library who's going to give us a little information about the Door County Reads. so blessed to have Michael Perry's work to enjoy, including this beautiful play, his only play, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it with everyone tonight. At the end of the evening, I will be telling you a little bit about what's going on at the end and after the programs are actually finished. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Mm -hmm. Summer here comes on like a zap tape hippie chick, jazzed on chlorophyll and flinging fistfuls of butterflies to the sun. The swamps grow spongy and pungent. Standing water goes warm and soupy, clotted with frogs, eggs, and twitching with larva. Along the ditches, hair and leg stalks of canary grass shoot six feet high and unfurl seed plumes. In the fields, the clover pops its blooms and corn trembles for the sky. If only could fly, you would see tilled squares, irrigated fields, forests and fence lines, swamps and wetlands. Here and there, a meandering stream, the whole works are done up in an infinite palette of greens. Corpses in the corn. Ten children we raised just uphill from there. Ten kids on a farm more rocked than dirt. But we made it, made it, and still sent 15% to the Pope. <laughs> and sons of you. Uh, <laughs> them geniuses uh, down at the highway department, they run the road right between the house and the barn. And Renetta taught the kids to rhyme. Before you cross, count to seven. Otherwise, you go to heaven. That girl, we heard a crash. I didn't even go down there. I just grabbed the phone, called the fire department, told them to bring the ambulance. I don't know the girl in that car crash, but I know her dad, Cubby. He used to be the fire chief. I remember her mom, too. I'd see her at pep rallies in the gym. 
I grew up here. After high school, I left town, worked as a cowboy, went to college, got a nursing degree, wound up writing for a living. Didn't see that coming. Didn't see any of it coming. Twelve years I was away, then I came back. Back to the village at the center of this story. New Auburn, Wisconsin, population 485. In a place from the past, I'm looking for a place in the present. The trick is reattaching. Mostly I keep to myself. Stay in my little room overlooking Main Street and scribble. I don't attend the local churches. I don't drink, so I don't go to the bars. I don't play softball. I don't go bowling. Can't poke them. So there wasn't much left to do. About a month after I returned, I joined the volunteer fire department. And then, then I began meeting my neighbors and rediscovering this place, one siren at a time. Neighboring, that's what us locals call it. Eleven streets. One four-legged silver water tower. Seasons here are extreme. We complain about the heat and brag about the cold. <laughs> Summer is for stock cars and softball. Winter is for Friday night fish fries and snowmobiling. No better way to get to the bar in a blizzard. <laughs> yeah. New, New Auburn draws its name from a poem, an 18th century elegiac pastoral. Oh, but that might not be your first thought when you come to town, say, on a November Saturday evening when all the pickup trucks are lined up at the gas and go with dead deer hanging out over the tailgates. Yeah, or if you hit the, the highway behind the spreader truck full of turkey manure. Or if you drive past Slinger Joe's automobile graveyard. Or past Puff, a pack of green air gold. Or the abandoned laundromat. Still half caved in and wrapped in yellow crime scene tank, you know, since Tricky Jackson sideswiped it. Run 70 to 35. If you notice, four out of the five gas stations are closed. Well then, you may strain at the relevance of lyric verse. Used to be, things were happening here. After the sawmills left, there were charcoal kilns, killed a couple of brick factories, a creamery. Old Snook Huston yeah. still talks about pick, pinching pickles from the two giant banks over by the tracks at the north end of town, over there by the hobo jungle. He says they was sour as hell. The pickles or the hobos? <coughs> That's Bob. Bob the one-eyed beagle. I can explain the nickname, but he'll get around to it soon enough. That also said Main Street, the one the Raider uh, <coughs> moved into. Used to be a free show right behind there every Saturday night. And they had a sheet on a, on a <coughs> Legion Hall and showed a movie on it. Popcorn stand, the whole deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, old Snook Hustons told me that during the Depression, you'd have a hundred cars parked back there. And this town had a band shell and an orchestra in a Philly. Oh, Charlotte Carlson said when she was a girl, the potato warehouses ran all along the railroad tracks from one end of town to the other. And passenger trains stopped in all day long. Even after they tore the old depot down, we used to get a solid stream of vacationers through here, packed in their cars, headed up north. Oh, but then in 1974, the state built the four lane. Yeah, ran it west of town. Around us. Past us. Well, nowadays the good jobs are 30, 40 miles away. The grand old buildings are gone. But the name on our old silver water tower, still there. And it's from that poem, a real poem, written in England by Oliver Goldsmith in 1770, and opening with the line, Sweet Auburn, loveliest village of the plain. Yeah, but the title of that poem? The Deserted Village. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes when the siren on the old silver water tower goes off, we have more fire trucks than firefighters to drive them. Yeah, but, you know, but we're not dead yet. Nah, we still have our Friday night football games. Meat raffles, you know, Brown Schweiger and Brown Oh, oh, oh potato oh, 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 I will talk the worst. In fact, plenty of Oliver Goldsmith poetic loveliness survives. Tree lined, peaceful streets, a number of trim houses on neat lawns. Lately, folks have been putting in a lot of work down at the park, 
getting it ready for jamboree days when we spend the whole weekend celebrating the place. But rust and desperation are never more than a backyard away. Because trouble is a volunteer fire department summons, we're often the first to discover it. Last year we had this call, house fire. I was working out that way and had my gear in the truck, so I just headed straight to the scene. I get there, the house is roaring. Smoke's a mile high. This guy walks up to me. Is it illegal to burn your own house down? Just wait right there. We'll get a ruling on that. <laughs> People want to read about white picket fences. But there's some gnarly barbed wire, too. A while back here, a man was accused of molesting a child. The day after he was charged, he was sitting in his pickup truck when the mother's, the child's mother approached. Give me your hand. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. There was a moment, a still, horrible moment, when the car came squalling to a halt. The violent kinetic spent and the girl was pinned in silence. One moment, gravel is in the air like shrapnel. Steel is tumbling, rubber tearing, glass floating. And then, utter stillness. As if peace is the only answer to destruction. The metal arc sings, the land drops away south to the hazy tamarack bowl of the big swamp. All around the land is rank with life. The girl is terribly, terribly alone in a beautiful, beautiful world. We train for this. We want to be ready to help, to make the call. That's Captain Pam Larson, 10 years with the department, factory worker, mother of four. Call, we call it. You take call, you're on call, you have a call. People always ask us, are you on call today? That's my little brother, Jed. He's a farmer. Here in New Auburn, we're on call 24 hours a day. You're here, you're on call. We carry our pages with us everywhere we go. We sleep with them right beside our bed. You get so you jump at anything that beeps. Way back when. They just rang the school bell. Then they got a siren for a water tower. Oh, next, they got a phone bar. You called and it rang the phone of everyone in the department. Now, we got technology. But first person in the hall still trips that water tower siren. You never know when the call's gonna come. They call on Sunday, Saturdays, holy holidays, any old Tuesday. Well, I've had people run right at my sidewalk just banging on the door. You know, because they know you're on the department. I was walking through the bar and someone hollered out their screen window. Ben's having a heart attack! <laughs> well, <laughs> whatever you are doing when the call comes, now it's what you were doing. Yep, supper, ball game, a little uh, slap and tickle. Oh, uh, okay there, champ. <laughs> I got paid over a hundred times last year. Fires, drunks, babies, grandmas. Injured farmers, scared vacationers, old fishermen. Every kind of bad news you can imagine. Well, it's not always serious. We have our frequent flyers. The little old lady with heart trouble who meets us on the porch all buttoned up and smiling with her suitcase packed. The lady who called us because her goose had died. Actually, it was dead in a doornail. Well, yeah, that was a tough one. She sent us a nice note later, though. Said the goose died with its wings out, so it went to heaven. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, how about that big old guy on Potato Lake who calls because he's fallen and can't get up again? <laughs> Minute we hoist him to his feet, he drops into his recliner, goes back to watching TV. Tip ups, we call them. <laughs> <laughs> but still, there are neighbors calling for help and getting us for better or worse. Hmm. What do you mean, or worse? <laughs> Remember that car fire we had out on Highway 40? Where it was just you and me and Lane Dominsky? Right after he tore up his arm in that milling accident. Yeah. Well, so 
there I am putting my life on the line consisting of one firefighter with one arm and one firefighter with one eye. Yeah, and one firefighter was the first volunteer in the village history to miss the monthly meeting because of a poetry meeting. <laughs> we all have our afflictions. <laughs> the thing is, someone is calling for help. Even right this second. Maybe somebody just dialed nine one. Well, it's like somewhere out there, someone's blowing up a balloon, and you don't know what about it and about it until it pops. What? <laughs> when it comes at night, the pager is a pickaxe hurled through the window of dreams, a crystal vase dropped in a parking lot. A sonic cleaver splitting the night wide open. Okay, throw out that there, poetry boy. <laughs> so yes, your heart flaps around like a startled perp. <laughs> Everybody's an editor. This time, the call came on a sunny, puff cloud afternoon. Attention, New Auburn Area Fire Department, New Auburn First Responders. We have a report of a one-car rollover on County Highway M near the intersection of Kennedy Road. Caller indicates one female victim may require extrication. Units responding, please acknowledge. I'm a butcher. I come running. I'm a farmer. I come running. I cook at the high school and I come running. I work for a trucking company. I come running. I run a repair shop. I come running. I'm a mother of four. I come running. I'm a writer. I come running. A roofer. Bartender. Police officer. Trucker. Logger. School principal. We, we come, come running. Hold on Jabowski's corner. The first bystanders are clustering, trying to help the girl. Tell her that help is on the way. Bystanders. We get plenty of those. Yeah, sometimes they mostly, uh, mostly they don't. Uh, we get lots of advice. Yeah, a lot of it from loudmouth drums. For some damn eye doctor, on his way to the lake cabin, he pulls up on a motorcycle wreck and starts giving orders. Oh, or you get to the ER and some Lexus driving chest cutter gets on your case because you missed a blood pressure. And you want a person to invite him to work upside down in a ditch at 3 a.m. where antifreeze is mixing with blood? Out there in the field, rescue work is like jazz. Improvisation based on fundamentals. A, B, C, they taught us. Airways, breathing, circulation. A, B, C. That's your basic chord structure. After that, it's all riffing. It's more like, like golf. You just gotta play it where it lies. Well, then a week after that surgeon shoes you out, you get blasted out of bed to answer one of the damn electronic alarms at his lake house, which costs more than 20 of our annual salaries combined. You know, and the alarm was just some raccoon trying to get to some fancy cheese in the trash. <laughs> Those lake people. They all moan about their taxes, but they sure want you there in a heartbeat. <laughs> you what they hate. We get to drop their carpet and look at what the chest cutters think is good taste, eh? <laughs> in the heart of New Auburn, everyone is converging on the fire hall. The simple building, low and square. The light in here is dim. The air is concrete cool. The coats and boots wait in their rows. The trucks are still. The beagle makes it to the fire hall first. He punches the door combination, punches the water tower siren, then punches the button that raises the truck bay doors. Others are arriving now, some on foot, most in cars and pickups. It's straight to the gear, then straight to the rigs, then straight out the door. From silence to the roar of engines, sirens biting the air, then fading, then silence again. Across the street, behind the Legion Hall, a sparrow chirps. Yeah, excuse me. Now, I know it's rude to interrupt, but especially when you're doing your whole, you know, pretty words thing. <laughs> you're a uh, whole Oliver Goldsmith Jr. Act. But there's something we might as well take care of right now. I call, I can tell you're all wondering about my act. It's all right. I know you're trying to be polite, but everybody wonders. It's pretty much that. When this one goes south, this one goes east. The deal is, I was born without an eyelid. Nothing to cover it up, nothing to protect it. The doctor, he said, never seen anything like it. He told my parents there was one thing they could try, a long shot, but he said it was a worth a shot. So what they did is, 
when they circumcised me, they took an extra skin and made an eyelid from it. <laughs> yeah, I've been cockeyed ever since. <laughs> Uh, what the heck? Now you know why we love the one-eyed beagle. But there's more to the story than Goofy. You know how he said he is one of three brothers? Well, he used to be one of four. His older brother Dave died in the line of duty. The beagle knows the fire service is no joke. And his first ex-wife, well, when her second husband When her second husband, in other words, the one she traded in for me. Yeah, when that guy was burning an explosion, we got called out and the beagle was kneeling right down beside me, giving him the best pair he could. The beagle's rougher than a cop, but he understands kindness. We all get a kick out of watching him tell the cockeyed story. He tells it every chance he gets. But here's the deal, that I, used to be just fine. The Beagle wasn't born that way. A few years back, he donated a kidney to his niece. When he came out of the surgery, something had gone wrong with that eye. The Beagle knows life comes with a price. I tell you what comes with a price. Matrimonial mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> right now, the Beagle needs a little extra cash. Wife number two just hit the road, but it's gonna take a thousand bucks to do the divorce. I wish she'd hit the road. And she's working at the gas and going, splitting shifts with my first ex. <laughs> two ex-wives, both working at the only gas station in town. Yeah. I gotta run nine miles south to Bloomer every morning to get for gas, coffee, and chew. I'll raise the divorce money in November. Off all the overtime I pulled her in year honey. Season. It uh, starts at 4 a.m., leave at 8 p.m., cut up 15, 20 deer a day. Last fire meeting, Beagle told me he knew the second marriage was in trouble when his wife started writing bad checks and hiding them. I told him he could see the checkbook when I got to meet the girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> the Beagle never stays lonely long. He's already seeing another woman. What's your secret? I got a big sign on my forehead. In blinking, blinking red lights, it says, dumb bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but what about you, son? Closing in at 30, you never have been hitched once. Truth is, none of us three brothers ever been married. We're sneaking up on over 100 years of combined bachelorhood. Our brother John is single too. Of course, that's not really a surprise. The man lives in a homemade log cabin, has no indoor toilet, and his only vehicle is a dump truck. And yet somehow he has failed to hook up on the local dating scene. <laughs> of the three of us, it's Jed who most wanted a wife. We've talked about it now and then, leaning against the back of a pickup or waiting for a hog to feral. He's happy living alone, he says, but. Sometimes this big old farmhouse gets lonely. What I really want is a country girl, someone who loves animals and the land the way I do. But it's hard to find a girl who wants a farmer. Yeah, yeah. More like hard to find a girl who wants a farmer who fixes his chainsaw on the table and moved his washer and dryer into the kitchen so they'd be closer to the front door. Efficiency. Celibacy. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people hear you're on the fire department and they say, oh, you're very noble. Not especially. That whole bold and brave thing gets way overblown. Basically, I'm on the department because in Nauvern, I got the two things they're looking for, a pulse and a valid driver's license. Plus, as a writer, I'm home a lot during the day. And even more than that, when I moved back here, my two brothers and my mom we're already on the department. <laughs> Peer pressure. <laughs> well, it's kind of cool being in the fire department with your mom. She rolls the calls in a big old Lincoln. Dad bought her for her, used, from some traveling salesman. 
You see it hammered down on the swamp road? It looks like a destroyer on wheels. I guess Dad's theory is to surround the woman he loves with a whole lot of steel. She's not the kind of woman you'd necessarily think was into roaring around to where the action is. Raised us real devout. Church every Sunday. Hair up in a bun. Never a naughty word. But way back when, when me and our brother John were taking our first EMT course, Mom said, oh, I've always wanted to do something with my boys. And she signed up. One thing led to another. Now we take up four folding chairs at the fire meeting. Favorite mom moment ever? The day we practiced vehicular extrication. <laughs> there she was. A five foot three church lady in a hard hat and goggles, armed with the jaws of life. Ripping the doors off a gremlin! <laughs> Sometimes Dad drives her to calls, like some chauffeur in overalls. Then he parks somewhere out of the way and sneaks a nap until she's done. I always say, we hold our family reunions in burning barns and at car wrecks. You know, the, the thing about fire and rescue work is, you can't just dip your toe in the pool. You don't know if you can stay in the water until you dive in. When you're training, long before you answer your first page, you wonder how you're going to handle the blood. How you're going to react to torn up bodies and guts and bones sticking out. You wonder if dead people will make you want to turn and run. There's no way to find out other than to get out there in it. First heart attack Beagle and I ever worked, it was a hot summer day. Right around supper time, I was grilling brats. Guy was out behind the house, flat on his back in the grass. His skin looked like wax. I checked for a pulse, and it was like pressing dough. Nothing. There was family there, some of them crying. This lady was praying. I popped up my pocket mask to give the guy a couple breaths, just like they taught us in class. Tipped his head back, put my face right down next to his. I remember feeling relieved that I wasn't scared, that I was tight, tight as a wire, but steady, that I was doing what they taught me to do. But I forgot to attach the one-way valve. Gave him that first big breath, and he blew cream corn right back in my face. <laughs> they didn't put that in the book. You kept going though. You breathed in the chest pump and it was there while I got the defibrillator fired up. Remember that dog? Oh yeah. That guy's dog was running circles around us. We worked so hard to save that man. Lights and sirens all the way to the hospital. I remember, remember my head sweat splashing on his chest every time I pressed on it. Yeah. He didn't make it. He died. Or maybe he was dead the whole time. When we walked out of the ER, his family was walking in. Shit, that was hard. Back then, the defibrillator had a tape that recorded everything. You had to go through your calls later with a doc. On that tape, you could hear us working, grunting, the whoosh of the oxygen. And that dog, barking and whining, circling us again and again. You know, watching us shock his master, push on his chest, pick him up and take him away. The cream corn, the dead man, they didn't bother me. That dog? That dog set me back some. There's this thing called the golden hour, meaning that the second that car came to a rest, we had 60 minutes to get her to the nearest trauma hospital. The second we cleared the hall, I radioed for a helicopter. We're in the ambulance like hell, but it still takes 20 to 45 minutes to get there. And that's not coming to get no here. Pumper one, proceed directly to the scene. You need the pumper right up there with the ambulance in case the fire breaks out or there's a fuel spill. It also carries the tools for cutting the car apart. Taker 1, you got traffic control to the west. Shut her down there back by Johnson's place. Taker 2, you cover the east end over by the old link school. Rush 2, we're going to need a landing zone in 12 feet past her. 
10 minutes ago, I was working dispatch at the trucking company. I cut out of there so fast, my chair's probably still spinning. God, I'm worried about that little girl. Everyone is in a circle now. We are firefighters and first responders and EMTs. We are also neighbors, classmates, and family. The girl is crying out. Her right leg is terribly injured. Femur fracture. Compound. Horrible. This alone can be fatal. There is so much to do. Put a plastic collar around her neck. Get the oxygen hooked up. Someone gets her leg split. The one that pulls the broken leg straight. The minute we tighten it, the girl feels relief. We feel it too. Anything to stop her pain. But now she's short on breath. My mom listens with a stethoscope. The lung sounds are getting bad on one side. Pneumothorax. This is a true emergency. This girl can suffocate in her own chest. We don't have the equipment to treat this. We cast our eyes to the sky, straight to the sound of the chopper. The girl says she's dying. We tell her no. No, help is on the way. If this girl doesn't make it, I'm gonna see her parents around town. It happens. Last year we had a heart attack. The woman's daughter was there. It'd been too long. There was nothing we could do. A week later, we're at the gas station, selling raffle tickets. Telling people the money will help us get better equipment, do a better job. That woman's daughter came by. Stopped at the table. So there you are, <clears throat> telling her that for two bucks, she can maybe win a deer rifle or some packer mugs, that her two bucks will help us save a life. And all you can think of is her crying beside her dead mom. Why, you just stood there useless. Small towns, nowhere to hide. We have her strapped to a hard plastic litter now. Packaged, we call it. Ready for the chopper. We keep checking your vital signs. Blood pressure, pulse, respirations. Shine a light in her eyes to check the reaction of her pupils. We recheck the leg splints, recheck the straps, check the amount of oxygen in the tank, fetch another one for backup. Her breathing is getting worse. A man kneels beside the girl, Cubby Ron, her father. He says, I love you, honey, you be strong. The chopper approaches with a thunderous buzz, cresting the pines like an iron blue dragonfly, circling, covering, then in a wash of wind and grit, settling to the earth. We tell the flight nurses everything we know about the girls' injuries. They work so quickly, IVs, a chest tube, something to knock out the pain. Some of us help more than the chopper cat. You gotta hunt the touch down, you know, stay along the blades are that close, they vibrate your body. Then we hustle back out of the way, we watch a chopper roar into the air. It rotates south, and then disappears over the hill. Captain! Yes, ma'am! You're seen. I'm driving Cubby to the hospital. We packed up then, got back to the hall. There's this feeling that even though something awful happened, you came together, you helped each other, did what you could. It was a tragedy, but we took care about ourselves, neighbors, helping neighbors. Driving the tanker back home, looking ahead, seeing the other trucks ahead of me, I felt settled, like I was finding my way back into the land, into the community. To feel at home is a rare, precious thing, and I began to feel at home that day. The word came back from town. The girl didn't survive. Death is a part of the thing. We won't always win, if you want to call it that. Sometimes the, th the hardest thing is how the world doesn't notice. I took care of a cop once, shot through the chest. There was a guy with a gun, and because it was a small town, the cop tried to talk to him. We did everything right, stopped the bleeding, followed all the procedures, stayed calm. The cop kept telling us how much it hurt, 
And when he couldn't talk, he squeezed my hand. We were so relieved when he got up to the hospital alive, but they couldn't save him. On the way back home, I remember I just wanted to flake down each and every car and just yell, do you realize what has happened this morning? That's how I feel about that girl right now. There's always this weird feeling when someone dies, like, like the world is one soul lighter and spinning just a fraction faster. The feelings fade, but for a while you carry a sensation in your gut. Like the rotor on that chopper, just slowly spinning down until it stops. We do what we can. Not everybody makes it. You do this for very long and pretty soon everywhere you look are ghosts. And now to the ghosts of this land comes another ghost. I'm not the same guy I was when I left this place. I like to say when I left here I was a farm boy, good student, and a fair defensive end. I returned a long-haired writer with soft hands and a nursing degree. I've since had to update the part about the long hair. <laughs> there are two reasons I no longer have long hair. The first is just a generalized prop failure. <laughs> <laughs> it just got to the point where there was no point. The other reason is, last spring we got called to a grass fire on the railroad track south of the town. I was right up in there, in the teeth of the flames, fighting for the black, as any well-trained wildland fighter will tell you that you must, when one of the other firefighters ran up and started patting me. Normally, you don't get a lot of that. I said, what are you doing? He said, man, your hair's on fire. So I cut it off. During my travels away from here, I did a little community theater. One of my first directors was a guy named Bob. He was from a farm country, small town like me, but he was gay and half Native American. For me, recess was about kickball and freeze tag. For Bob, recess was a gauntlet of taunting and worse. Sometimes when we were trading stories about our youthful milieu, battered pickup trucks, bass fishing, guys bragging up their tractors, Bob would puff out his chest in a big old heterosexual swagger and declare, that's my people. It was pretty entertaining. But it planted a question in me. If your people exclude you, are they still your people? When I come back from college on the coast, I knew I was home as soon as I saw Grandma bent over and showing her bloomers in the lawn. Oh, not my grandma. A plywood grandma and the plywood grandpa right next to her, one hand smack on her polka dotted undies. <laughs> oh, you think that's in bad taste? Well, run along and blow it out your pie hole. <laughs> we know what we like. Wooden tulips, plastic frogs from Walmart, plywood cowboy leaning on a tree, <laughs> plywood boy peeing on a tree, Virgin Mary in bathtub, green bait pepper on a rope swing, <laughs> propane tank, Painted like a corn cob, yellow signs that say Norwegian Crossing. A while back in the St. Paul Pioneer Press did a big two-page spread on lawn art. The headline said, at last, fertile imaginations are appreciating a little whimsy in the garden. And last, they had a toilet full of begonias on them by the, the mailbox since 1978. <laughs> They quoted an expert named C. Colston Burrell, winner of the Garden Writers Association of America's Qu uh, Coveted Quill and Trowel Award. Well, C. Colston declared that lawn art was making a comeback. What? Here in Nauberg, it never left. Wisconsin's official state animal, 
is a concrete deer lawn ornament. Yeah, or fiberglass Holstein. <laughs> when it comes to lawn art, you'll note that C. Colston Burrell prefers the term garden whimsy. And no plywood or plastic for him. He celebrates teddy bear topiaries, bronze frogs playing the cello, and faux ruins. Well, who needs faux ruins when your backyard beaches are busted clothesline, two bullet riddled washing machines, and a pinto on rims? <laughs> of course, it's not C. Colston's teddy bear topiaries that get us grumpy. It's that headline. When it was plastic frogs from Walmart, it didn't count. Oh, but now that the pretty city people with fertile imaginations are using rotten frogs, everything's beautiful. My favorite part of the article was when C. Colston Burrell said that lawn art wise, it was time to lighten up and fret less about being tasteful. Well, now that I can do. You grab yourself a six pack of lamps and a bag of uh, string cheese, Mr. Burrell, and get out of my begonias. And welcome to Navarre. As president, secretary, janitor, archivist, and sole member of the New Auburn Historical Society, it is my duty to inform you that it took four tries to properly name this village, not counting. Navern. In 1875, a man named David W. Cartwright located a clearing in the pines, put up a sawmill, and formed a settlement known as Cartwright Mills. In 1882, the Postal Service requested that the name be shortened to Cartwright. In 1902, a saloon keeper approached the village board and requested a liquor license. David W. Cartwright was a devout Seventh-day Adventist. As long as my name is on this town, there will be no liquor license. And so the village board took a vote and changed the name to Auburn. Yes, as I said, in a tribute to Oliver Goldsmith's lovely elegiac pastoral. Yeah, except what? Unfortunately, the adjacent township was already named Auburn. And I'm the idiot. Yes, well, it's true. <laughs> uh, this did cause some confusion, and in 1904, the Chicago Railroad, um, its passengers, uh, discombobulated by two consecutive Auburns, requested that the town change its name once more. And the best they could do was pack on no. Well, hindsight <laughs> is 2020. Yeah, don't talk to me about 2020. <laughs> the glaciers arrived first. 25,000 years ago, Main Street was a mile deep in ice. When the last mile receded, we were left with a raw, poetic topography of kettles and rains, canes and eskers and drumlins. Wildlife thrived. And humans follow. Race, uh, based on a copper lance point found outside the town in the late 1900s, we believe Paleo-Indian hunters were in the area 6,000 years ago. Next came the Sioux. Later, the Ojibwe. After a battle on the shores of the local lake now featuring lovely summer homes, the Ojibwe drove the Sioux west. The first white men in the area were fur-trading Frenchmen. By the time the lumberjacks slept, swept through in the mid to late 1800s, settlement of the area was well underway, fueled by the usual mincemeat of destiny and deception. Save for a few stragglers, the Native Americans were gone, leaving behind arrowheads and wild rice beds. By the 1950s, the county, Chippewa County, was decorated with red barns, neat crops, and milk cows at pasture. These days, down at the cafe, you'll hear people mourning the loss of all those little red barns. But Chippewa, as in Chippewa County, is a corruption of Ojibwe. Listen and the land will tell you, it has been lost before. We spend this life looking for a center, 
a place where we can suspend with all the wobble. The specific coordinates are elusive, scalable only by the heart. Not too far from here, a dance teacher named Barry Lynn lives in a weathered schoolhouse of a dead-end road with his partner, Michael. When Barry was a boy, he racked tobacco in North Carolina. The field work made him hardy and gave him a man's hands, but he was never like the other boys. In childhood, it was not easy for a boy with no appetite for mud or baseball. He speaks fondly of an aunt who, even then, even in Carolina, before the First World War, understood the boy was different. She'd sneak him bits of lace and old ribbon, pretties he called them. Like a scattering of bright feathers left by a flown bird, the pretties implied other worlds. Well, you'll know Barry if you see him in his, his floor top and his sandals, his uh, gold pendant, his longish snowy locks, <laughs> his shoulder bag, his eyeliner, and that's just when he's out for groceries at the IGA. Mostly the loggers don't pay much attention. Disinterest around here is a form of tolerance. And uh, for the ones who snicker, especially the ones who never, who've never served, I just let it slip that Barry is also a veteran. World War II, European theater. Don't ask, don't tell. Like hell. I go see Barry and Michael dance sometimes. It isn't far. Over the river and through the woods, basically. Their studio sits at the edge of an abandoned farmstead, a lily amid a stand of pulp. In between the flute music, you hear log trucks. It's an anomaly, an anomaly only if you think art belongs somewhere else. I don't know much about dance, but I know beauty when I see it. And sometimes when Barry is moving to the rhythm of his breath, or Michael marks a finger just so. I want to run down to the local tavern league softball field and say, drop your gloves, your bat, your beer, and come see this astounding, delicate thing. There are times in that studio when I feel the husk of my soul fall right off. The thing that brings you joy tells you a lot about who you are. The, the reading is not always definitive. The first year I was back in Nauber, me and the Beagle got assigned the duty of going down to the park on a Sunday morning jamboree days to clean up the beer tent, get it ready for the day. We got down there at 8.30 a.m. First softball game of the day was already underway. They had to start early to get everybody through the brackets. Lots of hungover hitters. We're in the beer tent, picking up paper plates, plastic cups, and napkins when this guy wanders in. Can I get a beer? <laughs> well, it is 8.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but you've been on the department longer than I have, so you make the command decision. Well, I guess there ain't no law against it. A little in there early in the morning for softball. <laughs> Damage my people. End of Act One. Normally we take an intermission, but we're going to rush through to try to it's okay. The call come in after midnight. Attention, New Auburn Area Fire Department, New Auburn First Responders. We have a report of an active structure fire, Lot 17, Sunnyside Trailer Park. Color is a relative. Reports one adult male is in the residence unaccounted for. Units responding, please acknowledge. When I heard the guy might be trapped in the trailer, I knew we didn't have much time. Fire can shoot through a trailer house in less than two minutes. Good news is, the trailer park is just down Pine Street. We had a shot. Calls out of the country? Mostly by the time we get there, there's not much to say. I was fueling up one of the tankers at the Gasicle after we spent half the night fighting a fire way up north, standing beside a giant yellow fire truck in wet, sweaty firefighting gear. 
And this woman says, Fire? <laughs> uh, yeah. Just stop it? From spreading. Here's a little trick for when reporters show up. Ma'am, ma'am, what can you tell us about the situation? Well, upon our arrival, the structure was fully engulfed. You always use that phrase, fully engulfed. Number one, it, it, it takes the pressure off. We can't be expected to save a structure that was already fully engulfed. Number two, they just love to say that on the news. Officials on the scene tell us when they arrived, the structure was fully engulfed. We have another saying, one we use just amongst us. Yeah, we never lost a basement. <laughs> <laughs> they are a rough bunch, but they're a good bunch. The organization of citizen fire brigades around disparate yokels like us seems like a noble extension of civilized society. But it has not always been perceived as such. Back in AD 112, Pliny the Younger witnessed a devastating fire in that portion of Asia Minor under his governance. Pliny wrote a letter to the Emperor, Emperor Tra Trajan. Dear Emperor Trajan, please, may I get some buckets and form a company of 150 firemen? No way. If people assemble for common purpose, whatever name we give them, and for whatever reason, they soon, soon turn into a political club. You understand? <laughs> History tells us that Trajan feared a sanctioned firefighting organization would wind up fomenting political disturbances. History has proven, of course, that mostly we just foment water fights, raffles, and chicken feeds. But at some point, you gotta face the fire. When we rolled up on that trailer, there were already flames boiling out the roof on the upwind end. I figured it was most likely that he was in the bedroom, which was on the downwind end. Oh, we swung on air packs and slapped our masks in place. We practice this over and over so we can do it fast. But oh, man, in the darkness and, and with all the spinning lights, Oh, and that cold! Well, your hands go numb. Well, sometimes you get it all on, then you're hung up with something silly, like maybe you're missing a glove, and then you look around for it like some blind, drunk swamp monster. <laughs> but then you're ready. It'll be a team. Okay, there's three of us on the hose. We're not trying to save this trailer anymore. We're trying to save a life. Here and there, you'll read that Benjamin Franklin founded the first volunteer fire department in America. It's not exactly true, but he did form a fire company in 1736 that agreed to put out your fire no matter who you were. Up until then, most fire clubs and societies would only extinguish your blaze if you were a subscriber. First you pay, then we spray. <laughs> if we could swing this time travel thing, wouldn't it be fun to get Ben and the Beagle and some beers together and Maybe some deep fried curds? Can you imagine those two talking? You about know what firefighting, ben, sure. About firefighting, sure, but about life. You know what Ben said, right? Well, he said a whole lot of things. Keep your eyes wide open before marriage, half shut afterwards. I got that covered. <laughs> Seriously, though, son. When are we going to get you hitched? Well, there is this girl. Oh. Uh, our uh, family moved in on the farm around the corner, back 40 butts up against mine. She came around wanting to talk. Uh, oh. <laughs> but I found out she's 17. No. <laughs> so I sent her away and told her, don't you come back. Yeah, there's trouble. And then there's trouble. Yeah. The first fire engine owned by the city of Alexandria, Virginia, was donated in 1774 by a surveyor named George Washington. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, John Hancock, Paul Revere, Alexander Hamilton, 
Aaron Burr, Benedict Arnold, James Buchanan, and even good old Millard Fillmore were all volunteer fire firefighters. Uh, the first female volunteer firefighter of record was a slave named Molly Williams. Yes, volunteer and slave in the same sentence. <laughs> The ancestry of the New Auburn Area Fire Department can be traced back to a village board meeting held April 2nd, 1902. When the handwritten minutes indicated that the farmer's store was paid $2.28 for pails used as a fire. Be not so fast or smoky. I was getting to that. Four days later, the pail bill was disallowed. No reason given. She manigans. In June of 1905, the board minutes note that if the village purchases a firefighting apparatus, the insurance company will elevate them from a fifth rate to a fourth rate town. Hey, we're not some fifth rate town. We can definitely pull off fourth rate. Woo! 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 By August, they were ready to kick the tires of a brand new fire engine. The sales agent, a Mr. T.R. Johnstone, gave a demonstration. The board found the demonstration unsatisfactory and asked the agent to provide ad additional demonstrations. And in fact, they detained him for over a week. The poor man. One can imagine him being in a hotel room at the Hotel Auburn, taking stomach powders and contemplating the evaporation of his commission. <laughs> but in the end, they bought the engine. Well, of course. Yeah. Meaning what? Meaning the boys on the board desperately wanted their new doodad, but they also wanted to appear skeptic and shrewd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're known as rubes, but we don't want to be taken for rubes. Right. <laughs> Takes one to know one. <laughs> Four years later, almost to the day, the board was entertaining bids on a hook and ladder truck. This is the thing about firefighters. You give them toys, and they want more toys. Oh, today we have seven trucks, two pumpers, three tankers, one rapid attack pumper, and a rescue van. All of the rigs carry extra equipment. Two of the tankers are equipped with small outboard mowers and can be used to fight grass fires. The main pumper is crammed with gear, air packs, fire axes, an array of nozzles and couplers, chimney fire equipment, powerful flashlights, a roof saw, collapsible water reservoir, hose wrenches, suction apparatus, a generator, a rack full of ladders, and 1,200 feet of hose, including LDH. Yeah. LDH, large diameter hose. <laughs> <laughs> And our newest toy, a thermal imager. <laughs> it can see through smoke, detect heat inside a wall, show the outline of a body in the darkness. A body. In other words, magic. <laughs> and now, in a line traceable back to those borrowed farmer store buckets, all that gear is converged on the porch of a flaming house trailer. <clears throat> well, if life was like the movies, this is the part where someone would holler, Let's rock and roll, you smoky sons of bitches. <laughs> Instead, you're thinking, Will this trailer collapse on us? Will the water pressure give out right about the time the furnace explodes? Will I get my socks wet? Will I get out of here alive? For all the firefighting cinematic potential, screaming sirens, snapping flames, roiling slugs of luminous milky orange smoke, most firefighting deaths have very little marquee value. The firefighter who dies silhouetted in a nimbus of flames while rescuing a child is a reality, but a rarity. More likely, get crushed under a collapsed wall. Get hit on the head by a waterlogged beam. <laughs> Touch a ladder to a power line. Or run out of air in some smoky hallway. Or meet the most common firefighter killer of all. Just a plain old fashioned heart attack. Everybody who joins up gets a copy of the department bylaws. I always make sure they read Article 6, Section 5. It outlines the draping of the headquarters for mourning. Yes, sir. And yet, we are still drawn to fire. Just as I am transfixed by Barry Lynn's dancing, 
so we are transfixed by flame. Fire is light-footed and shamanic, dancing between the visible and invisible, undoing matter one collapsed molecule at a time, wreaking utter destruction with a touch softer than breath. Fire dances on the grave of all it destroys. You know who loved fire? Sigmund Freud. In a paper called The Acquisition and Control of Fire, Freud claimed that man gained control over fire only after he gained control over his bladder. <laughs> According to Freud, the first man who saw a small fire and resisted the urge to pee on it committed one of the great acts of civilization. The desire to quell fire, he proposed, had to do with demonstrations of sexual potency in a homosexual competition. Furthermore, said Freud, it is no coincidence that Prometheus smuggled fire to a man in a hollow fennel stalk, a symbolic penis capable of extinguishing the very fire it carried. Oh, 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 see, wait. He must have been a real treat on a fire scene. <laughs> hey, ain't no psychoanalogist, but brother, sometimes an LDH is it's just an LDH. <laughs> As a firefighter, you must look beyond fire's hypnotism. You see it billow and snap. Watch it do its angry amorphous dance. You are mesmerized into believing it has no more shape than a soul. But to a firefighter, fire is fundamentally geometric. Our first class, the instructor drew a triangle on a chalkboard. He. Fuel. Oxygen. The fire triangle. The fire triangle isn't fire. It's only the potential for fire. Oh, for fire, you need one more ingredient. An uninhibited chemical reaction. The fire tetrahedron. The geometry of fire. So it's simple. You want to put out a fire, our instructor told us. All you got to do is remove one element of the tetrahedron. Yep. But the geometry of fire is one thing. The behavior of fire is something else altogether. It grows in volatile stages. The incipient phase of fire being born. Roll over. Combustible vapors accumulate at ceiling level, then explode. The free burning phase. Flash over when the entire room becomes superheated. Or the sneaky smoldering phase. That one will set you up for the Hollywood friendly granddaddy of them all. Bad draft. The smolder uses up all the oxygen. You'll hear the house just groaning for air. Stick your axe through the door and you'll get blown across the yard like a marshmallow out of a blast furnace. Wake up, if you wake up, in the nearest burn unit. Well, it's easy to forget that, to get reckless. A firefighting is exciting. Firefighting is fun. Jed won't tell you this, but last year he won our Firefighter of the Year award. We call him the Fire Rat. He loves to tear into a fire. He's not fearless because he's not a fool. But the places he goes to, you can see fearless from there. It's fun to see his eyes on the fire scene, see his demented grin, and know that he's ready to charge in as tight as he can get. Because for years, he was just my silent little brother. We used to joke that we never heard him speak until he was 14. Never really got a chance. You still do enough talking for both of us. <laughs> I don't know. I've always been happy doing my own thing. The fire department is pretty much the only group thing I've ever done. All I ever wanted to do from the time I could walk was to be a farmer. I never would have made it through high school except my folks set me up with a work study deal in town at the feed mill. The minute I graduated, I went to farming. He runs his machinery hard and he runs himself hard. You try to keep up with him, he'll work you into the dirt. But I like some fun now and then, and fires are fun. There are as many reasons to volunteer for this job as there are firefighters. But at some level, most of the folks who ride the trucks have an appetite for danger. They want to be tested, to survive, literally, a trial by fire. 
And we like the idea that when there's trouble, we're the ones that get sent in. Plus, you get big shiny toys and sirens, you get to drive fast, and you get to spray water, and you get to play with fire. <laughs> yeah, you see the young hotshots in the t-shirts, we walk where the devil dances. We go to hell so you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Just don't run me over when you hit retreat. <laughs> well, we get folks who sign up. They roar off to their first fire. It's all hot damn and rock and roll. And then the fire's out. And we spend three hours cleaning up. Another two hours back at the station scrubbing hoses and running checklists. And uh, two or three calls later, they just sort of fade away. Growing up, I spent enough time on the wooden end of a pitchfork to keep my palms decently calloused. The five summers I worked as a ranch hand in Wyoming, when I was swapping out spun bearings or welding up my own sickle bar, I had scabbed knuckles and thickened fingers. My fingerprints were visible in black grease. <clears throat> these days, well, these were the hands of a typist, or worse, a writer. <laughs> Head down to the cafe for meatloaf or Join the crew rolling dice at the implement store and listen. He's quite a worker. <laughs> that boy can knock the stuffing out of a softball. The man can flat run a wrench. Well, his checks are good. He's a hell of a shot. Not so frequently overheard. He crafts a lovely metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons I love firefighting. The water and soot and canvas hoses leave my hands roughened and swollen. My fingernails become outlined in black. For a few days, I can put my hand up for change at the gas and go without shame. First fire I ever fought was when I was just up the street from the trailer park. I'd only been in town a few weeks, and when the siren went off, I ran to the hall thinking, please, oh, please, let me not do anything stupid. I jumped in the brush rig with the beagle. Seasoned veteran, seen it all, passing around the lane. And what did you do, Mr. Seasoned Veteran? <laughs> we forgot the battery charger was plugged in. Roared out of there and ripped that sucker right out of the wall. <laughs> Man, that was a relief. Well, took the pressure off, son. That first fire, though, it was terribly cold. Below zero. By the end of it, we were all encased in a shell of ice. Our sleeves wouldn't bend, our gloves were stiff as steel. Every once in a while, someone fell and wound up helpless as a turtle on its back. Tony Barker told me to keep my nozzle cracked when I wasn't using it, otherwise the water would freeze it shut. You squirrel these little tidbits away. A year later, I taught a rookie the same lesson. Pass her down the line. Yes, sir. Okay, last safety check. We're ready to go. I'm on the nozzle. I'm right behind her with the thermal imager. I'm third. All the way in, I'll keep patting the hose with my free hand. That hose is our lifeline. In a spot like this, you never want to break contact with the horse. It's like Tom Sawyer's string strung through the cavern. It's your way out if things go to hell. They teach us to hang on to each other, never become separated. But it's tough, and you can yank off someone's boot. We stay low. I can tell we're in the hallway, but the second our helmet lights hit the smoke, they turn into white pillars. I can see flames coming at us. I sweep the nozzle back and forth, pushing them back. I pound the floor, see if it's sound. If there's a fire below, we can fall through and become trapped. I keep having this vision of a body in the bedroom. We all keep having that vision. That's what keeps us going. Even when the flames come roaring back at us. We lose some ground, regroup. Captain Pam leads us on another charge. She's holding the nozzle like an Uzi, just blasting away. We knock the first, we knock the fire clear back to the living room. Woohoo! Oh, the flames retreat. We have a secondary canoyer. I holler for the thermal imager. She'll be looking for a white blob, a blob of body heat, a body still alive, we hope. When I raise that imager right away, I see Jed could have saved his woohoos. There are flames above me. I heard flames to the right of me. We thought we'd knock them back, but they're just hidden in the smoke and steam. On the black and white screen, they pulse and twitch like ghost snakes. Now I see the outline of the bedroom door, and oh, 
Bad news. It's nothing but points in a frame. I scan as much of the bedroom as I can looking for that blob. A body. A person. Well, now that we waves are raging back almost over us, we desperately want to get into that bedroom, but we have to retreat again. Dance with it long enough, and fire will show you the difference between bravery and bravado. Yes, yeah, dance, but we are equally prepared to retreat. Firefighting is often framed in terms of courage, but courage does not always carry you forward. We're kneeling, getting ready for the turn attack when... He found him. He found him. He's up at the casino. 40 miles north of here? Pumping the slots? They found him! They found him! Back on out! This doesn't mean the fight is over. We just redraw the battle plan. Go from trying to save lives to saving property. The fire is getting so hot, the vinyl siding on the next trailer is starting to melt. That one lights up. And so does the next one, and the next one goes from a trailer house fire to a trailer park fire. So I swing the nozzle around and start spraying down the trailer next door. The casino. <laughs> so you end up with what you call an anti-climax, I guess. No grand victory, no grand tragedy. Well, it's dangerous and not to be taken lightly, but basically what we're doing out here when we haul our hoses out to the minivans and blazing garages, up smoking silos and over hot rooftops and down into steamy basements, is trying to disrupt the geometry of fire. Yep, kick the slats out of the tetrahedron. Well, I'm glad we went in, though. You know, it's good to look at Beagle or Lisa or Jet or any of the others who took their turns and no they proved them and proven themselves. Pulled someone out, we'd be the heroes on the news. The thing is, you do a lot of this stuff without thinking about it. Sometimes against training and better judgment. And hero isn't something you go looking for. That word is pretty much worn out. Kind of like everyone gets rid of it. Here's what I'll tell you. When I sent those three citizens into the trailer, they went because they believed a fellow citizen was trapped inside. The fact that the house turned out to be empty makes their actions no less heroic. Just won't hear about it on the news. Until courage meets circumstance, there are no heroes. Well, you're in for a treat now. You are a guest at the annual New Auburn Area Fire Department Awards Banquet. The banquet is a chance to reflect on the year past, tell a few new favorite stories, my new favorite story is about old Ross Johnson. Ross has been building things around here for years. His last project was the rain shelter over the bleachers down at the softball field. Like most of us around here, Ross takes off work for deer hunting. And last fall, he shot a legendary buck, 26 points, a monster, made the television news and all the papers. He was pretty low key about the whole thing, but if you want to sum up our local attitude, You'd be hard pressed to do better than Ross. Quoted in the Eau Claire Ledger Leader Telegram, yeah, I got a new pickup last week, shot that buck. Yesterday the Packers won, so it was a pretty good weekend. We'll relive that story tonight and a hundred others. It's a good evening. You get to eat till you're stuffed, hoist a brew or two, smoke and joke, and mingle with the heroes. Well, you can talk all you want Think about the heroes but I'm ready to party. Once a year, we drag out our uniform shirts, put on our pins and name tags, and head to the Sundial Supper Club for the annual Fire Department Awards Banquet. The Sundial puts on a hell of a buffet. Chicken and ham, fresh rolls, green beans, <laughs> mashed potatoes covered in yellow gravy, and a can that comes as big as your head. Daddy's food. <laughs> Billy, the kind you're hungry for when the dirt is froze two feet down and you ain't seen a green leaf since September. We eat and then we have a little ceremony. This year I got my 25 year pin. Several of us got certificates and patches for completing wildfire suppression training. But the best part of the banquet until I start making my karaoke magic is the gag awards. Oh. Yeah, so what? 
I was driving lead truck on the way to the Forster barn fire. On the left. Where you should have hung a right. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> followed me right down a dead end. Give that woman <laughs> the compass cap. <laughs> Woo! I dropped my pager in the toilet. Oh, Again. Yeah. <laughs> T. Norman. Who was built like the Pillsbury Doughboy on steroids. <laughs> well, poor old T ran all the way to the fire hall in his cowboy boots. Only to find out, it was nothing but a tough case. <laughs> he gets a pair of track shoes. Yeah. And this one here, he roars up to a corn fi cornfield fire with a brand new four-wheel drive brush ring. Big hero, but he can't get the pump started. <laughs> then the farmer, oh, he's not even a firefighter. He reaches in, turns the switch to on. <laughs> Once we were fighting a fire in a factory, and that same old so-called firefighter sprays me right in the face. <laughs> if you did something goofy that had anything to do with the department, you'll get an award for it. Skeet Ryan went fishing with set and tip ups when he fell through the ice, went in head first, but he held his pager above the water so it still works. You'll get water waves. The chief? Ran out of gas on the way to a barn fire. She gets a pair of roller skates. <laughs> and then there was this 3 a.m. fire call when one of our finest heroes bent over to pull on his boots and lost his sweatpants. His award, he gets exactly what we saw. A giant pair of silk boxers imprinted with cartoon hearts. <laughs> yes, it is an evening of great ceremony and dignity. But the grandest thing of all, when old Jed walked in here with a woman in his arm. The girl from around the corner. She finally turned 18. Jed went calling. Met her folks, took her for walks. We talked uh, about what we hoped for in life. A lot of it matched up. I used to tell that boy, you want a girlfriend? You're gonna have to climb down off that tractor. Ain't no girlfriends on the back 40. Imagine that. The beagle wrong about love again. <laughs> <laughs> when they walked into the Sundial Supper Club, it caused quite a stir. Jed didn't say much. He never does. Just went to his seat and started in on his chicken. But the new Auburn Area Fire Department, the only social circle in which he traveled with any regularity, had just received their in official introduction to Sarah Ann Posey. As had I. That girl, she's still in high school. Jed is 30. We go all, but you can imagine the buzz. Oh, my gosh. Where did he meet her? She's got the trap. Oh, 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 hold up. Is she from Bloomer? <laughs> all right, you got it. Got it Let's go. You got your, got your food, you got your awards, and there ain't no more door prizes. It's time to whoop it up. Give me a Coleman and carry yeah. I didn't know what to tell them about Sarah Ann Posey anyway. I didn't know much more than they do. I just hope my little brother's on his way to happen. <laughs> Here at the Sundial Bar, we're having a good time. The men are standing wide-legged and relaxed, yucking and flustering and drinking beer. The women are shooting darts. The beagle is winding up and gearing up to dance, getting ready to do his Beagle moves. The karaoke list is book solid. Over at a corner table, Cubby Rhymes and the Chief are teasing each other over hands of Euchre. It's nearly six years now since Cubby's daughter was thrown from her car on Dubowski's corner. I think of that long drive to the hospital and I wonder, what is the distance between that black hour and all these dumb jokes and happy cussing? There are husbands and wives. Lovers and cheaters, friends and kin in this place tonight, but most of our lives only intersect when the fire whistles. Yeah. This room tonight, there are marriages that won't last, lovers bound to stray, and friends destined to fight. Sunday, we're all Packers fans. Oh, on Monday, we're flipping each other off at the Walmart parking lot. Conservative, <laughs> liberal, before the school referendum, against. Country, rock, Ford, Chevy. But when that fire siren goes off, under those helmets, in 
see those rings? Then we are one. My people acting on behalf of our people. <laughs> Who's that the beetle dance with? <laughs> Ex-Mrs. Beagle, number three. <laughs> That's a sturdy lady. Can you just belly bump her? <laughs> oh, good lord. It's like watching Courtship Week on the Animal Channel. <laughs>
Hardin, no two, five people could hope to maintain. Jed had a milk cow. Down, down in the barn, one of those doe-eyed jerseys. He's a Holstein man. So you know that is Sarah. And it was wearing an embroidered purple halter. That's a sign someone new was doing the shopping at Farm and Fleet. Jed had this old surge milking machine. Fixed it up so he and Sarah could have fresh milk. What you do is you put these little rubber cups over each tit, and each time he got the final cup in place, well, that jersey kicked him right off. Yeah, well, he was putting them on again when Sarah walked into the barn. She'd been to town and was wearing tan slacks and white open-toed sandals. When the cow kicked the third time, Sarah climbed over the rail and walked across the cow pen just like she was wearing barn boots and overalls. She got the cow calmed down and pretty soon milk was splashing into the bucket. <laughs> when we left, she and Jed were kneeling side by side by the flank of that cow. Farm boy found his farm girl. I was feeding heifers. Attention, New Auburn Area Fire Department, New Auburn First Responders. We have a report of a two-car, 1050, at the intersection of Five Mile Street and Jones Road. Just two miles from the farm. I grabbed my gear and jumped in my truck. Right about the time I went past Ma's, she pulled out in that big old Lincoln. That intersection. I knew Sarah took it every day on her way home from work. So I was a little extra nervous. We always are when the call is close to home. The car, it was shoved clear into the ditch. Smashed it bad. Wasn't any car I recognized. And then, I saw Sarah in there. She wasn't breathing. She had a heartbeat. I gave her a breath. The 
day Sarah was killed, Jed had hay down. The next day I bailed it. Out there in the field, looking ahead to line up the windrow and check back the ties, I felt centered on the earth the way I always feel when I'm doing something fundamental in a familiar place. The same way I feel when I grab a hose and try to put out a neighbor's fire or hold an old lady's hand while Beagle gets the oxygen set up. One siren at a time, I'm coming back to this place. Once in a sub-zero night, Jed and I were in the basement of a burning house. I ran out of air and had to bail. We had the blaze down to just a few flames, so Jed waved me up the steps. I crawled out, and the minute I hit the freezing wind, I got scared. The first thing our instructors taught us, never become separated. I was wrong to leave, and he was wrong to let me leave. I stared at that dark basement, my guts as cold as the wind, until he crawled out a few minutes later. Anticlimax, as it usually is, until it isn't. We shined up the fire trucks and brought them all, all to the funeral. There were too many mortars to fit the Lutheran church, so the Catholics opened up St. Jude's. People can be so good. But that boy got some dark days ahead. The tough times start the day, the day the last casserole is served. He came out to help me hook up the bailer, you know. I found him behind the tractor, down on one knee, sagged with grief. I touched his shoulder while he wept, the sun hot on my back of my neck, but inside I was cold as if I was staring back at that basement. I felt so helpless, wondering if I would ever see my brother again. All around these townships, I see the dead. It's landscape, a sepulcher. There's a school sign erected in memory of Tumor Olson. There's the ski hill where Lisa Stansky died. In that house, we found an old woman dead in her bed. Here's where Harry lay. There's the house where they ran with the Jensen baby. Too late. Bob shot himself in that cabin. The train hit Jake at the bend. How important this is. The constant remembering these unremarkable memorials. Every death is a memory that ends here. And now, to the ghosts of this land. Six years now, since that wreck on Jabalski's corner. Last night I drove out there, just to drive. A thunderstorm had blown through. Steam was rising from the asphalt. It smelled thick like tar. The pavement's aromatic because it's new. After that girl died, the county recut and reshaped the corner, raised the roadbed, and tweaked the camber. It's better now. Fewer wrecks. Coming out of that curve, the highway straightens and drops eastward. I could see the whole country spread out before me, right over the hood of my truck, the land settling into an easy evening. Into that season where everything has risen up, prepares to fade, fall, this year's death blanketing last year's death. The land has its own mortality, but the sky, you should have seen it, the cumulonimbus cloud stacked and banked to the stratosphere, bronzed and brassed and blushed by the setting sun. These are clouds that make you long for wings. These are clouds that leave you not knowing what to believe.
Tomorrow at 10.30 in the morning, there are, is going to be a virtual panel from the UWGB, uh, Things Like Hope and Faith. So that one is going to be entirely virtual. And also at 2 o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow, virtual, uh, the Griffin String Quartet will be playing. Uh, all of the things that are coming up, including the very, very last book discussion on Monday, February 14th at 7 p.m., can be found on the Door County Reads website, doorcountyreads.org, in the calendar. If you go into the calendar, you will notice that everything that we have that was virtual has a recording that goes with it. So you will be able to see everything that's happened in Door County Reads for the last week and a half for the entire month of February. So if you missed anything, come back and take a look at it. Thank you so much for participating in Door County Reads this year and come back next year. We'll see what we have.